Entonces, eh, ahora será el turno de William. Voy a presentarle en inglés eh, solo para que él, bueno, me, me pueda entender y luego él va a realizar la presentación en inglés también. Entonces, los que necesitéis la, eh, para que preparéis, eh, si no, la traducción. Uh, William Nixon is a Deputy Chief Executive of Research Libraries in UK, and uh, he previously worked at the University of Glasgow Library as Deputy Director to a leading research support and digital libraries initiative, including Open Access and Ref21. In his experience in the uh, Research Libraries UK, He focused on the role of the research libraries and digital change strategies. Nixon also works across uh, research libraries UK networks, particularly, uh, particularly around collaborative effort to advance research libraries UK mission to transform libraries. He is a member of the International Association of Co-Ar Executive Board And he, that's the reason he is uh, today with us. So uh, he is uh, he's going to talk us about a uh, next uh, generation of repositories. And now uh, you have uh, the floor. So yes, <clears throat> gracias. And apologies, no español. So I'm afraid, um, but very Scottish. And um, so I will try not to speak too fast, which sometimes we do to help colleagues translating. So thank you very much for the introduction and thank you so much, muchas gracias for the invitation to join you for um, this, this two day uh, conference around kind of open libraries, open science and open learning. Um, I have been involved with um, repositories for 20 kind of gosh, 20 years. Uh, so, um, and it's something I feel very, uh, very passionate about and very privileged to have the, the opportunity to work in that space. So here today, um, I'm representing the Confederation of Open Access uh, Repositories. Uh, so CORE is an international organization. And if I can work out how to advance my slides. Um, so I really want to talk about as well, realizing the vision of an interoperable and trusted global repository network. And there's some really good words in there, which I could quite happily spend the next half hour just unpacking with interoperable, with trusted, with global. Um, and I think following on from kind of Pablo's talk as well, I see repositories very much as a sort of complementary uh, piece of sort of the open scholarship ecosystem, the infrastructure to the, the Chris system. They are very much about discovery. They are very much about, uh, about access. So uh, just first of all, a little bit about uh, CORE. And uh, so the Confederation of Open Access Repositories has, it's an international organization. It is 130 plus members. There are five members in Spain. Uh, and again, my thanks to Isabel Bernal, who is Spanish uh, member on the advisory board and had recommended me for this, this presentation. Uh, we are led by Kathleen Shearer, who's the core executive director. And I am on the executive board uh, as the treasurer. And Martha Whitehead is the Uh, the, the chairperson of CORE and the librarian at the University of Harvard. So CORE is about bringing together individual repositories and repository networks to build capacity, align policies and practices and act as a global voice for the repository community. So I think one of the things I really wanted to sort of focus on this morning were a number of the things that really came out of the the core meeting in the summer in Gothenburg. So the, the core meeting came after open repositories. So uh, which is another uh, kind of conference series, which I highly recommend. I've been uh, very privileged to be involved with as well. And there were five themes, which I think helped to inform what sort of involved next generation repositories. And I think the important thing as well is I think what we could call next generation repositories, it isn't just about 
technology. It's not about having a shinier, faster platform or a new unit, you know, user experience, although those things are very important. It is about some of the things which Pablo had sort of referred to. It is about that sort of trust component as well. It is about the interoperability. It's about the actual engagement and the, the buy-in. So I think as part of that, we need to see where repositories sit as part of the wider Diamond open access publishing system. Looking at that as it gains traction as a more credible and cost-effective approach. In Europe, there's a really very active policy discussions related to moving away from more of the commercial models and repositories can play a really important role around that. But I think there's a recognition that as you look at the, the sort of challenges in flipping journals and transformative agreements, um, as Wilhelm commented yesterday, you know, the report from the, U, the United Kingdom from JISC about how long it will take us to flip journals is a long time. So I think we really need to look at other opportunities, other models, and we need to make sure that repositories are part of that mix. And there's a, a really nice piece of technology called the core, uh, the sort of notify protocol, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, as part of this. I've already mentioned trustworthiness, and I think trustworthiness is really important. Um, it's sometimes quite difficult to define that. Core has a community of a good practice framework. It's being refreshed and will be released again in autumn. Um, but I think it's really important there to think about those relationships, those conversations that Pablo was talking about that you have with your academic colleagues, the advocacy, the engagement. It is a very, it is ongoing. Trust is something that, you know, you don't just, you don't just get and then you move on. It really is part of that ongoing dialogue. Um, I think, uh, I think I'm contractually obliged to mention artificial intelligence now in any, uh, any presentation that you do, but I think the impact of AI, particularly large language models, the advent of sort of chat GPT, again, thinking about trustworthiness, where do um, the content of repositories, the, the scholarly record, where does some of that sit? How can that inform some of the material that we start to see on our desktop? And then I think the last two are really important as well, thinking about adv advancing equity and resisting monopolization. So again, coming very much from an open source uh, uh, um, um, kind of scenario, but particularly around equity, thinking about uh, the sort of wider ecosystem there of things like digital object identifiers, persistent identifiers, the commercial costs for some of these, where some of our colleagues in Africa and South America are looking at less um, kind of less expensive options to do that so that they aren't just having to buy or kind of pay for, for DOIs. And then the importance of open uh, kind of climate change, being able to really look at how you can leverage the content in repositories to support the, 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 the material around open climate. You know, you look at the work that Open Air had done as well around COVID-19, building a, a portal around all of that. So the real sort of importance for actual societal and global change, I think, is really, really important and something which I feel very strongly about and which I feel that repositories can play a very key role. Um, so the links for all of the 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 the, um, the, the reports and everything that I'll be mentioning uh, will be in uh, are in the are in the slides. Um, but I also wanted to kind of draw attention to to this sort of report, um, the current state and future directions. This was published. Um, kind of uh, in kind of December 2023, um, but Liber, Spark, Europe, Core, and Open Air are really looking at how they can launch that joint strategy, strengthening the European repository network, reaffirming that commitment to work together to develop and execute an action plan to reinforce and enhance repositories in Europe. Because again, it's really important. As I say, I've been doing this for 20 years. We can't stand still, you know, technologies move on, the environment moves on, and it's really important to keep up 
to, to date with that. And the report had three main recommendations, which I think are really, um, I think are really important. Uh, one of them is maintaining up to date, highly functioning software platforms. And I think that's incredibly important. So beyond thinking about the next generation is it's incredibly important to actually uh, have that investment and have the infrastructure to have the current version of your software kind of upgraded and engaged. Being able to look at the good practices in terms of metadata, preservation, and usage statistics. So usage statistics are incredibly important. You look at services like Counter, which provide very kind of standardized uh, metrics. The importance of preservation. Preservation, I think, is something which has been perhaps um, been a, a poor cousin sometimes with repositories, but increasingly, as we have built up the volume of content, as we look at the, um, the rights retention, the author accepted manuscripts, which we are holding, preservation becomes increasingly important. And I think from my former institution, uh, I was really passionate about how important it was, for instance, around our, our theses. So content, which is held in the theses service, uh, that is unique content to the the university to the to the individual. It's not material which is just published uh, elsewhere. So I think it's really important to be thinking about preservation and also that visibility. So being able to actually come to talks like like this one today, being able to use these reports to actually engage and highlight how important repositories are in the wider ecosystem. So building on that report, an open consultation just ended in August there, um, and now work is going to be underway between CORE, uh, Spark Europe, and, and OpenAir to help craft that collective vision for the future of repositories. So I think it will be really, uh, really exciting to see that. There's a real interest in sort of building that momentum, and I think it's really important to see how we can continue to strengthen the European network. But I think what's also exciting is beyond Europe, and um, you know there are <clears throat> the rise of some new in, newer initiatives, shared repository services. For instance, Scholaris uh, is being uh, has been developed, uh, running DSpace in Canada, uh, being uh, administered by the uh, Canadian Association for Research Libraries. It's already got a number of participating institutions and early adopters. And really, its, an intent, its, its intention is to provide uh, a much more um, kind of updated and sort of innovative, but also integrated shared service for the Canadian scholarly community. So it's really exciting to look at uh, how that's emerging. Um, and also, I think they, they've done some really clever things with it because uh, for instance, University of Calgary's repository can look different from the University of Alberta's. So they are institutionally branded, um, but they are getting the advantages of scale. So those upgrades and those resources to create what they're describing as a vibrant national repository network, which I think is really exciting to actually see and watch. So uh, for myself as well, as Deputy Executive Director for uh, Research Libraries UK, Infrastructure is a key part of our strategy, and we've been doing a lot more at the moment around um, repositories. Um, just in the last week, um, we uh, did a panel session in the UK uh, on next steps for repository infrastructure. So we brought a number of colleagues together from universities, from uh, from funders, um, and. Again, this is this has been recorded. It's it's made available. We'll be uploading the uploading the slides, um, and it provided a range of perspectives. Actually, preservation bubbled up as a very important um, kind of element. But again, it was really sort of uh, exciting to get some of those perspectives, and also just to highlight where there are what could be called non-traditional outputs in research. So not just research data, but for instance. Um, plays and performances and films, you know, content which is perhaps less typical for, for research. And I think 
the other real, really important, great takeaway from that session and with kind of one of Pablo's former colleagues, George McGregor, who's at, at the University of Glasgow, is also the importance of actually maintenance and making sure that our repositories are actually kept up to date, looking at the OEI PMH endpoints, making sure that actually they are up to date and working so that we can take advantage of the harvesting and the global network which we actually have. So next generation repositories are a key part of CORE's strategy. Um, CORE did uh, a, a next generation repositories report uh, um, kind of a few years ago, uh, this was in 2017, um, and it had a couple of really important recommendations. And one of those came up at last week's talk Again, one of them is around adopting signposting to support machine access to resources. So it's brilliant. We need to think about the people who will be downloading and reading our material. But machine to machine interoperability is incredibly important for what is, is going on here. And the core Notify project has its origins in this next generation report. And core Notify is a really exciting, really transformational project which is accelerating community adoption through a standard interoperable and decentralized approach to linking research outputs hosted in a distributed network. So this also is really important for where repositories can play a role in diamond journals, in overlay journals, and in open peer review services. And I'm not going to go into all the details of the core Notify protocol specification, I've got links in the, the presentation here. Um, this has been led by a number of, of colleagues. We have uh, colleagues from across the institutional uh, repository platform, and we are very grateful to Arcadia for the funding which made uh, this project happen. Um, but really, it's, it's exciting to see where DSpace, where ePrints, uh, where a number of other repository services are starting to develop that. Um, Paul Locke, who is the lead on that project, presented on the, on the work in the summer at Open Repositories, and it's really fantastic to actually start to see some real examples around that. And there's a, a link in the, the slides to the, the Notify catalog, which provides further details. Pablo's already mentioned um, rights retention, uh, as has sort of uh, Wilhelm. Uh, again, uh, within the United Kingdom, this is something which uh, we've really seen um, kind of take off in the last couple of years, led by the University of Edinburgh, very much in the vanguard. Um, and uh, over the summer, I did a, a, a kind of led a panel session focusing around the role for rights retention uh, and repositories. And repositories are absolutely critical infrastructure there because we're asking people for their author accepted manuscripts, we're asking them for their publications. We need to have somewhere trusted, secure, and uh, available for those, those to go. And I suggest to you, the repository is the best place for that. Pablo and I can argue over if it's a Chris or not later, but I would argue it is the, the repository. You can see here from this map, there is about 30 plus uh, UK uh, universities, uh, including Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Glasgow, Strathclyde, and St. Andrews uh, within Scotland. So repositories have a very, very powerful role in actually underpinning and supporting rights retention. Uh, core, uh, who uh, have a, a fantastic discovery service, uh, are also doing some uh, exciting work around identifying and extracting rights retention statements from full text. So there's some, uh, some examples here from their, their blog uh, and really looking at starting to do that. So this is intended to actually do some, some harvesting around that and building a new model for its members uh, who can support rights retention. Um, I think core as well, uh, this is, I think this is really just a, just a beta. As I said, there's an AI elephant in the room. Uh, how are we best going to engage uh, and work with that around rights, around training, 
around discovery, around workflow, not just for our repositories, but for our wider library services. Um, Core GPT uh, was a, a, a sort of beta experiment for Core, starting to look at ways in which um, you could use the the, uh, the the trusted not again that trusted phrase the trusted knowledge of scholarly communication to potentially help to inform uh, uh, sort of some of the responses that you get from from Chat GPT. As I say, this was very much just a just a beta service, and I highlight it here just as an example of the sort of uh, experiments which uh, we are looking at and which which are important for repositories. So um, here in my final slide, um, I really just wanted to highlight what I think are very broadly some of our challenges as our next steps and our, our opportunities, thinking about what our best practices are. So as I say, making sure that your repository is in tip-top condition. I'm not sure how well tip-top translates in Spanish, but it's in good condition. Uh, thinking about the advent of sort of technology where kind of artificial intelligence is going to, to fit. The importance of trust, whether that could be looking at some of the, the good practice kind of opportunities. Um, taking pride and being incredibly uh, secure in the, how important repositories are in global equity in actually enabling us to share and remove paywalls and open up the access to the material, to not just the, the publications, uh, but also the theses and non-traditional outputs to a wider world and really accelerate that wider open scholarship and open science network. Um, look at where our partnerships are. So not just being able to be, uh, you know, uh, as I say, with CORE and Spark Europe, but also partnerships uh, nationally and locally, uh, sort of looking at that, uh, looking at opportunities for where you can continue to raise the visibility and the profile of your institutional repository. I think sometimes they feel uh, very much, not quite like an unloved child, uh, but they really sometimes need to be brought out into the sun and they need to be kind of showered with adoration uh, and also value added services. So thinking there around uh, opportunities for kind of preservation opportunities for using services like Core Notify to create new journals and new ways of scholarly engagement. So I think there are lots of challenges, but lots of opportunities for us in that wider open science uh, ecosystem. So, muchas gracias and thank you. <coughs> bueno, eh, ¿alguna pregunta en la sala? Sí, venga, adelante. Eso es para caldear el ambiente. Totalmente de acuerdo. <laughs> So I, I would like to, to know your opinion about, for instance, this year in July, I think, one uh, commercial publisher, I'm not going to say the name, uh, and so uh, sold part of the, or the, the rights to another company so called Google, uh, Microsoft um, for a, the artificial intelligence uh, models. So... Are the repositories open for that? And what about the rights? I mean, or the acknowledgement of authorship in in terms of this the use for 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 the AI? Yeah, I I think that's a really yeah I I think that's a really interesting area, and I think it's yeah I'm going to say it's a really interesting area. I think there's 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 an interesting tension between the fact that in many cases you know, with the licenses we want, but again, the licenses in many cases are not for, for commercial use. So, um, but we do want them to be used, but that's why I think things like um, Core GPT is a really interesting one, which was looking at a much more kind of closed 
um, kind of closed approach. Um, I was listening on the radio uh, this week, and I think I, I get the sense that, um, I think, is it California that has pushed back on some of the legislation around AI? And I get the impression that perhaps um, legislation and rights are possibly starting to catch up with that, and I think at some point we will have a better idea of where, of of where that sits for for repositories. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's an interesting and a challenging one. Thank you. Alguien más quiere plantear alguna question? No. Okay. So there's no other question. So thank you very much. Gracias. Okay.